chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. Keep that video cl uh, clip. Luke chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. And this is the um, English Standard Version. And it reads, And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her, her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we, we are so blessed, Lord. We thank you for this wonderful rendering of the Christmas story for such innocence, Lord. Our children, Lord Jesus, are such a treasure to us. And we are privileged, Lord Jesus, as we continue to teach them in the way they should go. And they truly will come to know what this re the season is all about. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will teach us, Lord Jesus, what the miracle of the manger is all about, Lord Jesus. I thank you again as you hide me behind your precious cross this morning. Lord, touch all those who are physically ill this morning. And we remember, Lord, our men and women, Lord Jesus, that are fighting a war, Lord. Bring them home to us safely. They are our thoughts and prayers. Again, thank you once again, Lord Jesus, for all that are here. In your mighty name we pray and everybody says. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Does he sound louder? <laughs> a number of points this morning and again why the manger what was significant about the manger well the first point I have is God came down from heaven it says unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior again when we think of the the Christmas story we we always have some type of rendering from our children and I notice parents come out, and moms and dads, grandpas and grandmothers, and we love to see our children's depiction of this wonderful story. And the thing is, is it's, it's kind of cutesy, because when you think of our children, and you think, of course, the babe in swaddling clothes, we have this wonderful thought about Christmas, because that's what it is. It's a wonderful thought. And, and just the, the way the atmosphere is in here kind of brings us that warm Christmas cheer. But when you think about why God came down, God came down as Luke writes, he came down as Savior. And we, we grab hold of that, and of course, we want to say to ourselves, was that the essence of the message when the angelic host said, this is the message that we bring to all of humanity. This is our message, and the message is, a Savior has been born for all of you. Let me say that again. That's right. We are in need of a Savior. And some people, we, we, uh, we kind of take a look at this and we say, why do I need a Savior? You know, I, you know, have I done anything wrong? What do I need to be saved from? And when we think about the Christmas story, we always kind of say to ourselves, it's a nice story, but me, in need of a savior, there's this evangelistic, uh, how do I call this? It's a cookie cutter way of going to reach people uh, in need of a savior. What do I mean by that? You'll have Christians come up to individuals and ask this very significant question. They'll say, are you going to go to heaven? Or should God let you into heaven? Or, are you good enough to get in heaven? Different types of questions. And of course, the person they ask that question to will always say, well, I am good. I do good things. You know, I know I've done some bad things, 
And that is the key statement. We all recognize that we don't always measure up. And there's that what we call guilt. We may call it guilt, we may call it a bad conscience, but God calls it sin. And because of sin, God sent his only begotten son to be our savior. That's right. And I think about this because the Bible tells us that we are in need of a savior. It says, unto you is born this day. Today is the day of salvation. That's right. Today we need salvation. And for those of you that are here, and you're here for the very first time, or maybe you're visiting, and you're saying, what is this guy talking about? I'm a good person. I do a lot of incredibly good things. Well, I'm here to tell you, Bill Gates is an incredibly generous individual, but without Jesus Christ, he's not going to make it. Because it's not about what you do. It's not what you give. It's not what you're all about. It's accepting Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. Yeah. You're in need of a Savior. That's right. So you could be the most incredibly nicest, most generous individual in all the world. But until you say, Jesus, come into my life, be Lord and Savior, you're not one of the children of God. And that's what the Bible tells us. And when we think about this, I was looking around and I was asking myself, if God came down to be my Savior, the Bible tells me I need him. And there was a Christmas card that I, I like to look for Christmas cards. I like cards in general. But there was this Christmas card and it said this, if our greatest need had been information, and this is somebody else's writing, anonymous writer, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us a financial planner. If our greatest need was forgiveness, and which it is, God sent us a savior. Amen. The Bible says, I need Jesus. And of course, the angels appeared to Joseph and Mary. And because they appeared to Joseph and Mary, it says that God came down from heaven. And the reason why he came down from heaven is to forgive us of our sins. The Christmas story, you know, I was going to ask Roly to do this. And I, I, I thought, maybe they won't quite grasp what this is all about. I was going to ask him to take that rugged cross and put it in front of that little manger scene so that when people see it, they'll go, what is that? But they go hand in hand. The nativity scene and the rugged cross go together. Jesus Christ came here to seek and save those that were lost. And when we think of the essence of Christian, uh, Christian, uh, Christmas, Jesus came to forgive me of my sins. Some of you, when you think about what Jesus is here for, we think, well, maybe Jesus was just a good person and a good teacher, and some people call him a prophet. Some people thought he walked amongst the people, and maybe he was just a regular guy. And he did some incredible things, but... Jesus was also God in the flesh. So when we think about the good news, it says in verse 10, it says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. What is this good news? Well, Matthew's rendering says this, that because Jesus came, he came to save his people from their sins. My sins, your sins. And I think, you know, some people have a tendency, and I'll pick on myself, because if I were to ask you a rhetorical question, how many of you believe you're a sinner? You know, wow, there's some people here that just raise their hands up. <laughs> Sometimes when we think about that word, we think sinners, we think, well, that's not really a good thing. Nobody likes to point themselves up. That's almost like, you know how AA people, they'll stand up, and then one of their big introductions, and I'll say, my name is Ben Refersal. I am an alcoholic, right? I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> okay. But it would be an example that I would stand up before Christians and say, my name is Ben Refersal, 
and I am a sinner. But I'm saved by grace. And see, that's the essence of when we think about God forgiving us of our sins. And that's what Matthew's all about, because Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 tells us that, that we needed a Savior to save us from our sins. Our sinful nature is just that. We, we have a tendency to, to think, uh, you know, we're always good enough for something. And, but you know, there's this guy called the adversary, the father of all lies. He's the devil. Let me say that again. His name is Lucifer. And you know, being a pastor, you would think that I have my life together. You know, pastor Ben has his life together. Things are going well in his life. But you know what? Even as a pastor, I have my struggles. Just like many of you, I put my pants on the same way, one leg at a time. And so I wake up day to day, and I know that the adversary is always there. Because the Bible tells me, just as he tried to attempt, just as he tried to tempt my Jesus, and the Bible says that because Jesus would not give in to the temptation that the adversary, that the, the devil said, I will wait for an opportune time. And that's what the devil tries to do to all of us. He waits for an opportune time to get us. To get us when we are most vulnerable. To get us when we are, are at our weakest point. And you could be riding along. And you could be driving, you could be sitting at home, you know, watching something on TV, watching some movie, or you could be cooking, you could be doing the dishes, you could be doing almost anything, living life. And the adversary will, at that particular moment, remind you of something you've done. Some of us call that a negative conscious. So, some of us call that, you know, things in our past. But I'm here to tell you that the adversary does that to bring you down. But the, but, but the Bible gives us this great news, which I find incredible. It says, for now, there is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let me say that again, because a lot of us don't get this. And this is a wonderful Christmas message. It says, for now, there is no condemnation. There is no guilt for those of us that are in, in Christ Jesus. In other words, when you accept Jesus Christ in your life, as the Bible tells us, because he forgives us of all of our sins, God has, this is a great thing about God, that's why I call it the miracle of the manger too. That when you accept Jesus Christ into your life, God has spiritual amnesia. He no longer remembers your sins. And that's, one, that's an incredible promise of God. God does not have a belt where every time you do something wrong that he puts a little little notch there. You know, and I usually say, I say this to married couples all the time. You know, God, you know, God tells us in the love chapter, keep no records of wrong. This is for all my married couples. Okay? Keep no records of wrong. Because we always, this is a phrase. You did it last time. That's how married couples say it all the time. You did it a year ago. You did it last week. Love means not keeping records of wrong. And God doesn't even do that. God has spiritual amnesia because when you say, Lord, forgive me of my sins, God says, what sin? What sin? I want to share a couple of promises of God here with some text so you'll grasp exactly what I'm talking about. 1 John, 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. Amen. A great promise. Because I have fellowship with my Father God, and I have, I'm one with Jesus Christ, he purifies me, he cleanses me of all my sins. A powerful thing about the manger. Isaiah 118 says, Through your sins are like though your sins are like scarlet in blood, they shall be white as snow. Wow. One more. I gotta nail this home. It says, Jeremiah 
chapter 31, verse 34, if you're taking notes. For I will forgive their wickedness. And maybe, I think this is key. And will remember their sins no more. God came down from heaven to forgive us of all our sins. Past, present, let me say that again, present. So, for those of you that are here and you're saying, well, Pastor Ben, I've done a lot of crazy things now. And I'm into a lot of crazy things now. God is here to tell you that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He wipes the slate completely clean. You know, my wife and I, we love to go to San Francisco. And we were doing this one video, we were just kind of playing around. I think it was either Monterey, I'm sorry. We were in Monterey, and of course, we had our phones and all that, and of course, the, the, the ocean would go out, and then of course it would come forward. So we decided we got some little stick, and we, we wrote on the sand, because of course the wave was still out. We wrote on the sand, and we put, my sins. Right? My sins. Of course, I was there with my phone, right? Of course, I didn't want to get wet. <laughs> I had my tennis shoes on. I can't get those things all messed up, right? So I'm videotaping it. I told my wife, remind me when the, when the wave starts coming, right? Of course, you, you get the essence of it. My sins, and I watched the waves come in. And as the wave came, and of course it washed over the words, my sins, and of course it went back. It was as if it never happened. Amen. And God is trying to remind us of that today. That's right. No matter what you have done, Christmas is that, that particular season. God reminds us that Jesus came down from heaven just so he could forgive you of all your sins. And he has done that specifically, not just for humanity. Let's, let's, make, let's make this personal. Not just for the Church of Bethany Christian Center. He did it just for you. It's personal. And that's why when we think about the manger story and all these verses that support what Jesus is all about, that's what God, is, God wants us to uh, grab hold of this morning. And lastly... See, I told you it wouldn't take so long. An infant king says here, and while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a, bit, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger. Everybody say manger. 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 So, I guess my question this morning is, I guess it's up there. I didn't think I left it up there. Why didn't God just present himself as majestic? I mean, think about this. He is God of the universe, creator of all things. Why didn't God just come down all powerful? I mean, he could have done that. He could have split the sky wide open and said, I am God. He could have revealed himself to all of us in that manner. And all of the world would have stood up and took notice. He could have done it that way. I was, I was thinking about this. It says she wrapped God in cloths and placed him in a manger. He could have been awesome God. Well, we know God is awesome God because that's one of his attributes. That's right. He's an awesome God. And God could have come down out of heaven and done that the very same thing and shown us. His infinite power, he didn't do it that way either. We know he's glorious because we've seen his glory. You know, every time there's a miracle that takes place in the household of faith, and, and maybe there are people here that says, I don't know if miracles really happen. I'm here to tell you, we serve a God of miracles. Amen. We've seen, we have witnessed. We are eyewitnesses to what God, not just what he does here, but what he has done in the lives of people. We have seen people that were literally, I mean, outside these four walls have come in here and I don't know where they've been. I don't know where their lives have been. But all I know is they come before this altar and said, I had a life. And it was a life where I wish I never had. 
But somehow the atmosphere, the devil had them and he had them all tore up. Life was so rough for these people. But when they came in, somehow, some way, God became a glorious God and an awesome God. And all they had to do was say these wonderful words. Forgive me, I'm a sinner. Come into my life. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And God came into their life and it, with one false swoop, God, just like the way he did with the, the writing, my sins. He cleansed them. Let me say that again. They came into this building not knowing what to expect. But with one false swoop, God cleansed them. And the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Amen. The old is gone and the new has come. Amen. And that is a Christian story in essence. It's the greatest gift that anybody could ever receive. And when you take on that Christmas story and the promise of God, you recognize that that is what the infant king was all about. Why did God come down all majestic? God wants to draw near to us. Isn't that, that's a wonderful thing. God wants to us, he wants to draw us near to him and he wants to, us to draw as close to him as possible. Do you know, we sing a song. I remember when this, first, this song first came out. I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. I used, to, I used to practice another way. And my way of practicing before was not having a personal relationship with God. The way I practiced and the way I got to know God was no different than the way you saw the video clip. I went to this place of worship and I got to hear somebody speak and it was so much God is there and I am here. And I just came in. It was like that all the time. I went and I came. I went and I came. There was no real relationship there. I was not a friend of God. In fact, I wasn't allowed to talk to God. I had to go to somebody else to talk to God. I could not speak to God on my own because I was told I was not capable of speaking to God on my own. Something happened. And this is one thing God wanted us to understand when we think about the manger. It's a story that takes place after the manger. And it has everything to do with being in a manger. We call it Resurrection Sunday. But during the crucifixion, something miraculous took place. Something so miraculous that there was something that divided all of humanity from God, and it was called the Holies of Holies. We could not enter into the Holies of Holies. It took somebody else of greater rapport to go and be in the presence of God. But during the crucifixion, one of the miraculous things that took place is they call it an earthquake took place. And some people believe that an earthquake took the veil that separated all of humanity from the holies of holies or being in the presence of God, that an earthquake took the curtain or the veil, if you will, and tore it from the top to the bottom. Amen. But God, in his love for all humanity, wanted to show us that he loved us so much that he wanted us to have access to him. Amen. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. So God tore the veil, not an earthquake, God. He tore the veil so that we could have accessibility to him. And God wants us this morning because that is what the manger, the manger is all about. God created this little manger scene so that we could come before him and literally say to God, I have issues in my life. I've sinned. And what are these sins? There are countless sins out there. I don't want to enumerate all the sins that we've been part of in this life because this life, again, could literally tear an individual apart. But as you come boldly to the throne of grace as God has taught us, 
It means you come confidently. It means you don't have any hesitation. It means you have no reservations. God tells us you can come. And come knowing that I will meet all of your needs. All of your needs. And that's God. That's right. When you think about a baby, God came down in a manger scene as a baby so that we would not be afraid to see him. Do you know how it used to be back in the day? In Exodus chapter 20, it says, when the people saw the thunder, these were the Israelites, and they were on this big old mountain. They were on the base of the mountain. And when the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, in other words, God enveloped this mountain, and they trembled with fear. You thought the cowardly lion trembled with fear. Whoa! <laughs> You think about the cowardly lion, right? And, it, and I think about that when I read that. It says, they trembled with fear. And this was during the Old Testament time. But God, when Jesus came and began his ministry, everywhere in the Gospels, God says, do not be afraid. Fear not. It is I, Jesus. So we go from... Fear and trembling? Look what else it says here. They stayed a distance. They were so fearful of God. In fact, it goes on to say this. And they said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen. They needed Moses to go be this spokesperson to God. And it says, but do not have God speak to us, or we will so in other words, they were very fearful of God. And God wanted us to understand that was then, this is now. Come on. That's right. You didn't get that, church. Oh, yeah. That was then, and this is now. God wants us to come without any reservations. And this is what the Christian faith is all about when you think about the Christmas story. God said, I'm going to send, and I'm going to send my only son in the form of a baby. i got one more verse I want to share with you guys. It says Philippians chapter 2. Some of us read this and we think, wow, that's kind of complicated. But it says, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, slave, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Some people think that, that Jesus' greatest sacrifice is during Resurrection Sunday. I always think, well, that was Jesus' greatest sacrifice. No, that wasn't his greatest sacrifice. Jesus' greatest sacrifice is when he left eternity, when he left heaven to come down to be with us. That was a sacrifice. Because then, time means nothing to God. In eternity, there is no time. But to come down out of eternity and step into our realm, everything literally stops. And he gave up all that just to be like you and me. I want to share this story with you guys. God made himself understandable. I saw this, and I, I wanted to share this with you guys. I love to tell stories, but this one was really nice. This kind of explains Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. It says, a prince wanted to find a maiden suitable to be his queen. One day while running an errand in a local village for his father, he passed through a poor section south side of Stockton. I'm teasing. As he glanced out the windows of the carriage, he, his eyes fell upon a beautiful peasant maiden. During the ensuing days, he often passed by the young lady and soon fell in love. Everybody goes, oh. 
but he had a problem. How would he seek her hand? How could he order her to marry him? But even a prince wants his bride to marry him freely and voluntarily, and not through coercion. He could put his most splendid uniform and drive up to her front door in a carriage drawn by six horses. But if he did this, he would never be certain that the maiden loved him or was simply overwhelmed by his splendor. The prince came up with another solution. He would give up his kingly robe. He moved into the village entering not with a crown, but with a garb of a peasant. He lived among the people and shared their interests and concerns and, ta and talked their language. In time, the maiden grew to love him because who he was and because he first loved her. This very simple message is almost childlike. This is what John is describing in his gospel. God came and lived among us. He revealed himself to us in an understandable way. And this is precisely what Jesus did. He became flesh just like you and me and made himself understandable. Man. The greatest gift that the Father sent his only begotten Son. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, that whoever should believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's a Christmas story in itself. It is the gift, as one person once said, it is the gift that keeps on giving. That's right. You could ask any person that has given their life to Jesus Christ. It could have been yesterday, a week ago, a month ago, four months ago, 15 years ago, or have been serving God for more than 50 years. They will tell you they have no regrets. That's right. Because to be in the family of God is much favor. Let me say that again. To be, in the faith, to be in the family of God gives you much favor. I would rather be blessed in the family of God and go through so much difficulty than to be out of the will of God and be just experiencing what this life has to offer. Because, as my sister just said, this life is temporary. You know, I work in Lodi, and sometimes we think that life is going to continue on and on and on and on. We think of Christmas and we think it's a wonderful time of the year. Everything's so beautiful. Even when you're going shopping, if you have to admit, I know people go, oh, I don't like the hustle and bustle. I don't like going to the crowds, the malls or this. People are so mean when it comes to trying to get in a parking spot. Just understand something. It doesn't matter where you park, just get in the mall. Okay? I mean, I'm just, that's just Pastor Ben telling you, park far away. It'll give you less stress than waiting for somebody to get out of the parking because you're in there mumbling like Pastor Ben would have done in the past. What are you doing? Move. What are you doing? Playing with your phone? I see your lights are coming out. Bear yourself the Christmas aggravation and go find another parking spot. Because all that's going to do to you is ruin your whole mood for shopping. Because why are you going shopping anyway? You're going shopping because you want to bless somebody. Think about that. You could be outside trying to find a, find a parking slot and be so angry so that when you go in to go shopping, you forget why you went shopping in the first place. <laughs> Christmas is all about the giving. And when we think about the manger scene, God came in the manger scene because he loved us that much. He loves us. And he wants us to not ever feel like we can't come, come and, be a, and approach God. He came in the form of a baby so that even ordinary people like shepherds can come into his presence. 
And none of us should ever feel that I'm not worthy of God. We should never say that, well, he doesn't know what I've ever done in my life. God knows. And you know what? He's not concerned about what you've done or what you're doing. He loves you that much. Just come before God and watch God move in your life. Amen. 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 Let's pray.